ஜாயின் பண்ணிருக்கிறோம் எல்லாருக்கும் நமஸ்காரம் கோதா கோவிந்தா ஸ்ரீமதி ராமராஜா நமஹா குட் ஈவினிங் டு ஒன் அண்ட் ஆல் ஃபார் ஆல் ஆர் ரிப்பீட் ஆடியன்ஸ் திஸ் இஸ் அ சீரீஸ் ஆஃப் டாக்ஸ் கண்டக்டட் பை ஸ்ரீ ஸ்டேட்ஸ் அண்ட் எஸ் டிடி பாடசாலா வெர் இன் வி பிரிங் இன் எமினன் ஸ்பீக்கர்ஸ் டு ஹாவ் டு ஷேர் தேர் நாலேஜ் டு ஆல் தேர் பேரண்ட்ஸ் ஸோ தட் parents are able to gain insights and help children grow in our sampradaya uh, fashion so just a small introduction about uh, shri shri tales and sd patshala shri shri tales is a non profit organization uh, imparting the knowledge of vaishnavism to children through creative creative and joyful learning sd patshala is shri uh, sadagopan tirunarayana swami uh, divya prabandha patshala founded by uh, shri ram bharati mama in 1986 uh they have they conduct uh, devakanam training for all nalaira divya prabandham pasarals so uh, these two organizations together are conducting this series of talks so today we have uh, prabhatine shakkar namaskaram ka she needs no introduction in the sampradayam circles she is very well famous but i want to take 5 minutes to give a bio about her because we are very proud to have her so here is a short uh, note about her Shrimati Prabha Sinesh is the disciple and daughter-in-law of UA Karunakaran Swami, a recipient of President Award for Sanskrit. She is the granddaughter of Ahobala Mamat, 43rd uh, year's brother in Purvashrama. She is born to a traditional family, is nurtured with spiritual values, uh, learned Divya Prabhandam and Deshika Sotam right from childhood. She started doing Kalakshepam uh, from her father, Shri UV Saranathan Swami, and uncle Shri UV Nelvai Swami and Arayan Swami. from the age of 16 having done schooling from pune she also developed a flair for the language marathi and she began composing kavitas and abhangs she has simultaneously she was pursuing and excelling in regular studies and in due course of time she acquired masters degree in biotechnology from the university of mumbai with a gold medal and took the officer office of a lecturer at an esteem college in bombay by this time she started delivering spiritual discourses too she was blessed to get wedded into a spiritual family uh, uh, too and she got married to shri uv sena sena swami the grandson of shri uv ashukavi sarvabhauma shri nidhi swami here her spiritual journey was empowered more as she started receiving kalakshepams from her father in law shri uv karunakaran swami who is also her samashrayan acharya shrimati prabha has been delivering lectures in the cities of pune mumbai and chennai since the past 12 years she has made a significant contribution through her online lectures which feature in youtube facebook and whatsapp she has delivered a number of lecture series on shri lakshmi stotram ramayana deshika stotram vishnu uh, pushnu puranam tirupavi and many more shrimati prabha proficiently delivers upanyasams in four languages namely tamil english hindi and marathi another significant contribution of shrimati prabha is she tirelessly trains the younger generation to get involved in a rich heritage of shri vishnu sampradaya She is the coordinator of Sampradaya Manjari E-Patshala run by GSPK Group. She is also writing articles in Vainava Kural English to serve a similar purpose. Her lectures and writings are simple, lucid and impact creating. Above all, her commitment to serve our Sampradaya is Bahraman. Koti Namaskar Maka, uh, welcome. You may start your lecture. Adhyan, Jai Jai Shri Sudarshana. I'm very, very happy to be a part of this wonderful satsangam. It's a great bhagyam to be here today. Uh, the kind of commitment that Sishri Tales and STD Patshala has been showing towards Sampradayam is commendable. Very, very creative and soulful is how their approach has been. So it's, it's very nice to see the progress of this Balavainavan series also. So a uh, very... very blessed to be here today so today adian have been given the topic of dharmic diet so let's get started with this is my presentation fully visible yes am terrier yes yeah and the title um theriyar da because adian ku ad maraira madri irukku terrier mela what is diet then terrier terrier okay right no problem so what is diet abdin paathomna 
I'll speak in English, Lia. Yeah? That's what I was told. Yes. Okay. So when we say diet, what is diet? It's very simply the food that we eat normally. Now, if we go to the scientific definition of diet, according to the WHO, we have this big sentence which tells us about what a diet is. A healthy diet is a foundation for health, well-being, optimal growth and development. And it protects us from all forms of malnutrition. And they also go ahead to explain what is an unhealthy diet. So unhealthy diet is one of the leading risks for global burden of any disease, mainly for the non-communicable ones, such as lifetime diseases like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, etc. So diet is the root of well-being, is what is the general scientific understanding. Then comes what is a balanced diet. As we saw in the definition of WHO, it talks about a healthy and an unhealthy diet. So diet is consumption. The consumption may be healthy or unhealthy. So it's important to ensure that our diet is balanced. And if we go to any middle school science textbook, it will all explain chapters on balanced diet. So a balanced diet is what? It is nothing but something which contains all the nutrients required by the body in optimal amounts. So the right amount of carbohydrate, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, everything together constitutes a balanced diet. So this balanced diet, when consumed regularly, will ensure good growth, health and disease-free life. So today we are going to see why we need this kind of a balanced diet and how it is related to dharmic diet. So basically, if we see now, balanced diet is nothing but eating in a disciplined way. Because only if we are disciplined in our eating habits, we will have right growth, right energy. We can avoid nutrient deficiencies, have good immunity and thus be disease-free. So basically, discipline is nothing but dharma. So that's where the term dharma comes in. Dharma on the whole is all about righteousness. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing in the right way at the right time in the right amount. All that is dharma. When we look into the scriptures for definition of dharma, they talk about it as vyavastha. Or Vidimurai in Tamil. So, what do we understand by that? Now, we all know that oceans or rivers all have banks. What if a water body would cross its banks? It would be disastrous. Suddenly, if a water body crosses limits, then there is flooding. If there's a tsunami, it's devastating. So, everything is good only when it is under control, only when it is bound by its limits or when it is within its border. That is beautiful. Anything which exceeds that limit can be dangerous. So, playing within the limit is all about dharma. There are certain things permitted, certain things which are not permitted or which are prohibited. So, if we try to cross any of these barriers, then we are in trouble. So, dharma essentially is the vyavastha or limitation which is set for any particular thing. Or we can even call it as a set of rules or vidimurai as it is called in Tamil, which gives us a good guideline of what exactly is to be done. How is it to be done? And what can be achieved by doing that? So it's a set of guidelines. So when we apply these guidelines to eating, our diet becomes dharmic. So dharmic diet is all about discipline in food. So today we shall be looking at four main topics. And the first topic we shall be dealing with in detail so when we say discipline in food, we are looking at 
discipline in food timing discipline in food type discipline in food quantity discipline in food quality discipline in the manner of consuming food and discipline in serving food the next topic is about fasting so what do our scriptures say about fast fasting whether it's needed not needed the third topic is about sharing of food which is a main concern for children today and fourth we shall be looking at some examples of the followers of dharmic diet and how successful and glorious they were so starting with the first topic we are looking at discipline in food in terms of timing now this is something that we all generally would be practicing at home i'm sure but when we are committing to a particular lifestyle it's better to keep these as a guideline because dharma is all about having rules having guidelines so we have four important things to remember when it comes to food timing we should never eat without bathing and that is told to us by swami deshikan in the ahara niyamam kuli mudalanavai seyyadu oonu munnum he says ugavartham is the end of the pasal he says that this is prohibited without bathing one must not eat now here adian would like to bring in a small uh, point that this kind of a practice can be in fact it should be inculcated in children from childhood it is mostly a practice that kids are given something to eat the moment they brush their teeth generally we try to give them milk pal techi pal saapadrudu that's a very common thing that's found across households but if we try to inculcate this habit of telling the child to go for a bath and then have anything to eat it would be very very beneficial for the child going forward because as we shall be moving through these slides we shall also be looking at certain aspects about food and restrictions that we are supposed to follow under certain circumstances so it becomes much simpler for the child to get into those habits if he or she has a habit of bathing and only eating anything for that matter be it liquid solid whatever have a bath and then eat that is the right way to eat in fact it is told in the scriptures that sandhya vandanam should be performed without having consumed anything so if we happen to do upanayanam for a child at the age of say 8 or 9 and if he has been used to drinking milk in the morning then it will be very difficult for him to give up on that habit and get into a delayed routine of food so it is it would be advisable to try to train kids right from the age of say 4 or 5 that they should have a bath before they are given anything to eat next thing about food timing is we should have two main meals in a day according to the shastras one is what they say about the prasadam of ijya radhanam that denotes late morning or noon time and then night we have a good meal which is post sandhya kalam sandhya kalam is the time of sunset so post sunset not very late we can have the night meal now in between those these two meals one or two snack like foods can be had now it's very important to note that for kids we need to adjust the meal time in such a way that they get good nutrition they are not i mean shastra is very very friendly it will never mean to starve anyone or anything it's just getting discipline the right way definitely eating sumptuously eating happily eating what we like and all is absolutely fine and permitted by the shastras just that we need to time the meals of children in such a way that even these dharmic rules are followed so if our child is going to school what do we do as adian said going to school is actually a boon in a way that the child has to bathe before going to school so if he or she has to catch a bus at 7:30 it would be good if we wake the child up send him or her to bathe and then give the child milk and maybe a snack and send him to school and obviously 
we send the lunch box with him or her which would contain a good meal a good nutritious meal then after coming back he has another snack he or she has another snack and early dinner before going to bed so that's probably the kind of routine that most of us are following this is also what is ordained by the shastra so that's good for us now one thing that we should desist from is eating during sunset or at midnight the time of sunset is meant for prayer it is meant for sandhya vandanam for the upanita men or boys and for ladies it's meant for lighting the lamp and reciting shlokas or stotras in front of the lord so eating at that time is not permitted we should avoid eating during sunset post sunset dinner is perfect and when we come to food type we should consume sattvic food that is completely understood now when we say sattvic food it's important to know the kinds of food that need to be avoided three kinds of doshams are associated with foods they are called as jati dosham ashraya dosham and nimitta dosham so when we go to understand what these are things may be clearer when we say jati dosham it means they are prohibited by nature itself by nature in the sense because those fruits or vegetables or food items are the way they are they are not to be consumed that means they inherently have some property which can inhibit the sattvic tendency that we have that is jati dosham we look at examples for each one of these just trying to explain what they are the next is ashraya dosham so when we talk about this we refer to food items which are grown at wrong places or which are obtained from wrong wrong sources the third kind is called nimitta dosham this refers to other sources of faults let's get to that in detail soon so when we look at jati dosham the kinds of foods that are directly rejectable because of what they are the list is quite big actually and i have just enlisted some three kinds of foods one is a list of vegetables which should definitely be avoided if we wish to have sattvic gunas the first group is the one which consists of onion garlic drumstick radish bottle gourd ridge gourd siri keerai red agathi keerai etc then we have milk now milk is good but it should be from either cow or buffalo other sources like milk from horse donkey camel sheep and all is to be avoided and of course non vegetarian food is to be avoided so all these are not permitted because of the constituents that they possess let's try to understand how and why for example if we take onion and garlic why are they prohibited shastras strictly prohibit the consumption of onion and garlic we have the yagnyavalkya smriti which says palan dumbit varaham cha chatra kam gram kukkutam lashunam grinjanam chaiva jagdva chandrayanam charet palandu refers to uh, onion and lashunam lashunam refers to garlic so these two vegetables have a tendency to completely make us rajasik and hence should be avoided in fact if one were to consume these even unknowingly very intense prayaschitas are told by the shastras for example the chandrayana prayaschita which is supposed to be very very difficult to perform so this is what the scriptures say about these vegetables now if we look at the scientific aspect of this we can understand that these foods are rajasik in nature basically because they don't keep our mind at rest because the body is not at rest these vegetables can aggravate bowel movements and very very likely possibility of developing ibs happens with regular consumption of these vegetables and they are all eye irritants for sure i'm sure we must have seen or read about how just peeling an onion can give us tears 
and consumption of these vegetables definitely gives bad breath and it can also cause heartburns so these are all scientific downsides of these of course if we try to browse the internet we'll have immense benefits of these vegetables which they talk about in detail we are not going to that side of it in fact we shall be dealing with that side of it separately in this lecture itself in general these vegetables are to be avoided if required to be consumed as medicine then it can be consumed in the form of a medicine for example if we have some kind of a condition where garlic has to be consumed as medicine there are garlic pills available in the market and if required if a medical practitioner has advised that then the shastras do not prohibit us from taking that it is allowed to take in the form of medicine but just that now we cannot argue and say that just because i am consuming a garlic pill at one point of time how is it different from consuming garlic regularly so can i start consuming garlic then the answer is no so medicine should be considered as medicine and should be taken only if it does not have any other substitute if there is a condition which can be treated just by this and by nothing else then it is allowed as per the shastras so that's about onion and garlic now as told before because of all these physical conditions mm. they can stimulate rajasic activities like anger reacting to situations much faster like not having composure the calm state of mind is lost also the big risk of these vegetables is that they are addictive if we start consuming then there is a tendency there is a need that arises within us to want to consume it more and more and this addiction for that matter any kind of addiction other than addiction to the supreme soul is difficult for the path of spirituality so if we have to be addicted let us be addicted to goda govinda and no one else so the addiction to onion and garlic makes spiritual paths perception difficult then we come to rich god and bottle god surai peerk sanam tinnar surudi yore says the ahar name of swam deshikal so surudi yore is the ones who recite the shruti or who follow the path of shruti or vedas so anybody who wants to have a vaidika life or a dharmic life should stay away from these vegetables again these vegetables have a lot of issues associated with them like ms aspergation they put a lot of pressure on the internal organs so what happens is all kind of energy that is present in us goes in trying to digest these difficult vegetables so we we are not energized enough to think to stay calm and to develop mentally and think spiritual so it's good to avoid these then when we talk about radish it is quite uh, shocking to see references about radish there is a reference from the mahabharata which says raktam moolakam inyahu stulyam gomam sabhakshanam shvetam tadvidhi kaunteya moolakam madiropamam i'm sure this sentence would have made sense on its own as i read it consuming radish can be equated to consuming alcohol or consuming even cow meat says the mahabharata so it's that wrong to consume radish again when we go to the science behind this radish will be praised like anything actually i actually browsed the net before coming to see what the world has to say about these vegetables and there were so many positive reviews to see but then it is a known fact even proven scientifically that this can interfere with thyroid health it can hamper iodine absorption and cause a lot of thyroid problems and we know that when there is thyroid issue then basically all the hormone setup is imbalanced and that leads to that leads to again a lot of focus on health which takes away a lot of our time and mentally physically involve us in mundane things taking our mind away from spiritualism so radish is also to be avoided now when we spoke about jati dosham we saw these then comes nimitta dosham sorry ashraya dosham ashraya dosham is the items that are grown in wrong places in the sense many a times we try to avoid the greens or kiray as they say 
when we do not know the source of where they are grown. Many a times we can see while traveling by local trains or so that there are a lot of, uh, what to say, temporary vegetations of these greens that are there. Now we don't know what is the source of water that gives them the supplementation that they need, whether they are growing on some sewage or what. So such things are to be avoided. Like when we do not know about the source of something or when we don't, uh, we when we cannot vouch for from where it comes, how it has come, then that is to be avoided. Now, what comes under this category? I don't have a slide for it, but this is definitely a very important topic of discussion. Now, like for onion and garlic, we don't have pramanams for uh, potato. And potato was an unknown vegetable to India. It was not grown in India. It was got by somebody else. Sweet potato is native in origin. Potato is not. But potato has been associated with these vegetables generally. When, whenever they say, they say, uh, we say when we say in Tamil. So it's always associated with onion. So because of the ashraya dosham, people try to avoid potato. So those are examples of ashraya dosham. When we do not know the source of certain things, elders feel that it is maybe better to avoid. Of course, there are scientific arguments to it saying that potatoes probably very, very sadhu compared to all these vegetables that we spoke about. They all have a very pungent odor or they can cause irritation in the eye or they smell bad or something. But potato isn't like that in any ways. Nevertheless, since the source is unknown, elders try to avoid using it. Then comes nimitta dosham, like other source of faults in the sense that if food is associated with some kind of a vessel into which it is not supposed to be kept, then we should try, we should avoid consuming that food. We should not consume that food. So that becomes nimitta dosha. Now, we can go to food type. Like when we look at types of food, we are looking at uh, the discipline in food in terms of timing we saw first. Then we are looking at food type where we saw three types of doshams. Now we are looking at the types of foods that are available. Sattvic, Rajasik and Tamasic foods. So if we were to define Sattvic foods, what are they? Any kind of food which can generate good character and enhance getting better knowledge becomes Sattvic food. Rajasic foods are those which trigger more physical action than knowledge. Like consuming something can make us more active. For example, if we were to consume a lot of uh, spicy stuff, then what happens? The entire system is energized in a way that we immediately want to go and fetch ourselves a glass of water or try to calm ourselves down. So the whole system gets completely activated when we are eating Rajasik food. On the other hand, if we consume Tamasik foods, then it results in laziness. Because tamasic foods are generally the defective ones which promote wrong thoughts, which make us get into depression. Like if we are lethargic and if we are lazing around all the time, then some thing sets into us like we are missing out on something, we are falling short, we are not where we have to be, we are not up to the mark and so on. So such feelings make us more tamasic and this leads to poor knowledge and non-progressiveness. So, sattvic foods are tasty and succulent and they facilitate longevity also because they're laden with nutrients. Also, they give good knowledge. They make us healthy, energetic and basically they're easy to digest. So, there's not much of time spent by the body in digesting this food. So, regulated or balanced intake of sattvic food can keep our life happy and balanced. Now, Rajasik foods. What are Rajasik foods? Either tasteless foods can be Rajasik or things which are too spicy, too sour or too salty or too hot or too cold. Anything in extreme becomes Rajasik. Tamasik foods are the ones which are kept for long. Now, there is there is this, uh, what to say, practice or maybe it's a cult that people cook for a week and keep it. That's not a great thing to do because 
food which is stored for long becomes unsuitable for consumption because the tamasic quality of the food increases every day. Tamasa is uh, lazing down. So if we are trying to do something beforehand and keep and reap the fruits of it for a long period of time, that's just a, it's a kind of manifestation of laziness. Of course, it's completely understandable that we have students abroad who are studying, who don't find time to cook every day. That's all completely understandable. But if this practice of cooking for cooking and keeping, refrigerating, freezing for a long period of time can be minimized, it would be appreciated. Even if we have to go with some fresh fruits or simple food, it may be better to have it fresh or at least not keep it stored for a long period of time, like a week or so. I've heard many of my friends, some of my colleagues also saying that we all cook on Sunday. So... <laughs> Sunday is the cooking day and the rest of the week is the eating, are the eating days apparently. So that's not a good thing. In fact, it's preferable not to even store like for two or three days. It's very true that we should not waste food. That's very important. So it would be good to try to cook what is required for the day and try to not keep it overnight or at least not for two, three days. Adian is just trying to be practical for the Shastric norms that we have because sometimes some things are very shocking like how we just saw for radish. That is very shocking for Adian when Adian came across that uh, reference. So it may not be possible for us to follow everything verbatim but when we know the rules we can try to avoid whatever we can. So that is Important. It's important not to use food which has been stored for long. And tamasic food category also has the food which is not offered to the Lord. Now, whatever we eat should be Bhagavat Prasadam. Something which is not Bhagavat Prasadam should not be consumed. Now that covers the point of eating from outside other places or people's house whom we are not associated with or whom we know do not perform Tirvaradhanam for the Lord. That should be avoided because that all comes under Tamasic category which is not good for spiritual development. The third kind of Tamasic foods that we are looking at are foul smelling foods. If we feel that there is some kind of smell coming from the food then better to avoid. Now when we talk about long storage of food, pickles, uh, badam, aplam and all are not included. They are all permitted to be kept for long. However, if pickle starts smelling foul, then it's not to be consumed because it becomes tamasic in nature. Of course, all these will come under simple health care also. But the beauty is that Shastras also prescribe all of these so beautifully. So how Shastram is so scientific is also something that we get to know when we look at all this. So that was about the kinds of food. Uh, Adin was just talking about Ashray Dosham. So, Ashray Dosham refers to the food which were which are grown on unclean lands or food which is served from iron vessels and all. Now, at night, we should avoid certain kinds of foods. That is also something which comes under Ashray Dosham in the sense that the timeline of the timeline for a particular food makes it unsuitable for consumption, which may be consumed otherwise. For example, we have Sizem gingerly oil and curd which are to be avoided at night but they can be taken during the day. Similarly, on Ekadashi, we should avoid cooked rice. We are going to look at Ekadashi in detail later. Now let's look at the things that we need to avoid at night time. Sizem, Sizem seeds, Sizem oil, curd, all are to be avoided at night. However, curd can be made into buttermilk and hat. In fact, Rambaraga uh, Sulva. So it's like curd anytime which is consumed as buttermilk is preferred and ghee which is melted is preferred. That, that is good for health. And we can also see that it's easier for the system to digest it. So Swami Deshikan says All that are to be avoided at night, he says. Now the reason behind this is Sizem or yellu can cause what is called as GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. That's called heartburn or nenjikarikar, as they say. 
that's what is termed as DERD and curd can promote mucus formation and actually in Ayurveda curd consumption is prohibited at night. So all these are things which are which can cool down the body when the temperature is, al is already cool. So those are to be avoided. Similarly, chewing beetle nut without beetle leaves is also not permitted. Vetrilaimun tinnade tinnum pakum, he says, Swami Jishikan says, and he ends the pasaram saying, Vilakkinare. This is because these beetle leaves are highly beneficial. They have eugenol and hydroxycavicol, which are anti-carcinogenic. <laughs> and uh, beetle <laughs> nut or pak is known to be a pro-carcinogenic factor for oral cancer. They say that anybody who keeps on eating chewing pak is in the risk category for oral cancer. But if you consume it along with vetthalai, it is not as bad. Of course, everything has its limitation. One should not keep on chewing beetle nut and beetle leaf throughout the day. There is a time for it and the time for it is after a meal. So that should be taken into account. So basically, as we see in under Ashraya Dosham, how the place and time of consumption of a food is ordained by the Shastras. Now, when we talk about Nimitta Dosham, we talk about other sources of faults. Like, uh, this is a very sensitive thing. When food is cooked for everybody, but somebody greedily devours it up all by himself, then it becomes it becomes very bad. Then if even if something is remaining from that food, it's better that other, others don't consume it because it has been greedily devoured. So it has the dosha associated with it. So that is not to be eaten. Similarly, food which has been smelt by others, split by nails, unclean, unwashed, unprincipled, that is anacharamana sapadu, should be avoided. And of course, yachan, that is definitely to be avoided. Food touch, that is touched by saliva or sneeze, that should be avoided. Now, there are exceptions that we know, need to know in food type. As Sadian said, as medicine, things can be consumed. Similarly, to sustain life, even avoidable can be consumed. So, if somebody is on the verge of dying, like if he or she, he couldn't consume a morsel of food at that moment, he would lose his life, then it's okay to consume anything. In fact, there is a story of the sage who was wandering about when there was a drought and uh, he, was, he was so hungry. He was hungry for months now. He didn't get a morsel of food. And uh, he thought that he couldn't sustain it any longer. At that time, he found a hunter who had some fruit with him and the fruit was a forbidden fruit that he had. And he had water with him, which he had kept in a bag which was made up of dog skin. So the sage went and asked that uh, hunter, oh hunter, I'm very hungry. Can you give me something to eat? So the hunter said, uh, this is the fruit that I have. Actually, there are many versions to the story. Some versions even say that he had meat. And the sage said, you give it to me, I will eat. He had whatever the hunter gave him. He ate about two handfuls of it. And then since he had not eaten for so many days, he started getting hiccups. So the hunter offered him water. To this, the sage replied, what is this? You are giving me water. That too from a bag of dog skin. The hunter laughed. He said, I just gave you food. In fact, you asked me for it and I gave you and you ate it. And now you're saying this about me for the water that I'm giving. The sage then said, see, that food that I asked of you was to sustain my life. Now that you have given me food, I can sustain till I can find the kind of food that I'm supposed to eat. And consuming even a drop of water above the required to sustain life in the unprincipled way or the anachara way would be wrong according to the Shastra. So let me go my way. So this is what Shastras say and we've had followers of Shastras to the letter of it. So that's about eating anything to save one's life. Then we may sometimes consume food which is defective without our knowledge. So that doesn't account to any sin. And as Adin said some time ago, fried condiments like aplam vadam or even when we are traveling to have roti tied and you know carried over for two, three days is fine. 
but it's fine only till they lose their taste if they're going to lose their taste or if they're going to smell bad then it's not fit for consumption similarly the water from the ganges has no limit for use ganga teertham can be perpetually used no expiry date for it now there is this pasuram from the ahar niyamam which says you can accept without hesitation food without water food which is cooked without water fruits which are naturally available and boiled rice vadam snacks like appam seedai roti and all even if they are old but if they lose taste do not use it that's just what we discuss now that's the pramanam for it as adian said some time ago medicines which are even prohibited foods are allowed and they can be taken with buttermilk or with soaked rice water kalakkamila nanneeril vaitha sorum kari morum says swami deshikan so in fact ayurveda prescribes taking medicines in this form like it's better to take medicines with warm water or soaked rice water or buttermilk for that matter so that's about food type now when we go to food quantity it's very simple the first meal always have breakfast like a king that's what even the western world says so that's also something that they've learned from our shastras apparently because shastras say eat the first meal sumptuously the first meal is something close to noon so that is to be had sumptuously at night eat to half full stomach the rest one fourth to be filled with water and the rest quarter to be filled with air this this will ensure best digestion now when we come to food quality it's very important to eat which is right like never eat stolen food spoiled food or as we saw in the nimitta dosham category these three we saw there smelt by others and split my nails unclean unwashed and touched by saliva and sneeze next we come to manner of consumption now this is very important this is a practice that we have to follow every day so basically anything that we cook should be offered to parimal bhagavat prasadam it should be it can be it should be ideally offered in tirvaradhanam but if tirvaradhanam is not happening in a house for some reason at least whosoever cooks the food can chant the 27th pasuram of tirupavai and mentally offer food to the lord and seek his blessings for acceptance of that food before eating always wash hands and feet before a meal sit on the ground and eat for better digestion chant govinda before eating for sure and even while eating you can chant govinda in the mind thank the lord before and after eating for the boys who have undergone upanayanam parishechanam is important it is pranahuti should avoid talking while eating and avoid drinking water in between unless it's in inevitably required so these are all general practices that we follow now the manner of consumption also includes the sequence of priority for food always offer food to the guests first then to children aged people and then finally the middle aged can eat now for good digestion there is a mantra the sixth shloka of garuda panchashat सत्यादयै सात्वतादि प्रतितमहिमेभिर् पञ्चभिर् व्यूहभेदैः पञ्चाभिक्यो निरुन्धन भवगरळभवं प्राणिनां पञ्चभावं प्राणापानादि भेदात् प्रतितनुमरुतो दैवतं पञ्चवृत्तेः पञ्चात्मा पञ्चधासौ पुरुषौ उपनिषद् घोषितस्तोषयेन्नः इट इज नॉट वेलिंग डीप टू द डिटेल्ड मीनिंग ऑफ द श्लोका बट it talks about prana panaadi veda pratitanumaruto daivatam panchavritte he all the five vayus in our system like prana apana udana samana vyana will all be in a balanced state if we recite the shloka thus ensuring good digestion and absorption in the system so if we can learn the shloka and recite it it will be great then we come to the manner in which food is served the one who serves food is also to be remembering many things first of all before serving we cook food so cook food with sincerity and devotion we are offering it to the lord so it's very important to say that if you're making something even for the birthday of our child say so we must not say i'm making gulab jamun for my child said inniki perumalukku gulab jamun thiruvullo abdi solli to we need to think about offering it to the lord while cooking that's very important of course 
the child is going to get it as Bhagavad Prasad. Next, we offer the food to Lord in specific dedicated vessels, which is called as Devapatra. Like, we do not use the same vessels from which we eat to offer to the Lord. We keep a separate set of vessels for doing Amse to the Lord. This is very important because it's a kind of upacharam or a kind of uh, respect that we show to the Lord. And it also shows that we care for him. So we have kept something separate. Like how we would keep a specific plate for our child and the child eats only from that plate. Similarly, it's separate for the Lord and it would be good if we can afford to have silver vessels for the same, then we must do it. We should do it with affection. So we should serve with affection. We should serve the Lord with affection and the Bhagavad Prasadam with affection to anybody whom we serve to. And the most important thing, the important human value that the Shastras say is never refuse offering food to anybody who is hungry. If there is an, anyone hungry coming, do not think of anything. Give away whatever you can. And another thing is never serve directly from iron vessels. Always change it and then do. Of course, these are all things that we practice every day. But since we are listing down the Shastric norms, we are talking about this. So now we've covered the first topic completely about discipline in food in terms of timing, type, quality, quantity, quality, manner of consumption and serving. Next, we move on to fasting. What does Shastra say about fasting? Now, intermittent fasting is the in thing today. IF is what is talked about all across. So this is basically a lifestyle diet prescribed by Sampradaya. Unnada nalgalil un, andippo un, narananar adipaniyum nallor nalum, nalliravil unum, ivai unnar dame. When all you should not eat, says this verse. Unnada nalgalil un. We must not eat on the days when we are not supposed to eat. Now this in, for Sri Vaishnavas essentially refers to Ekadashi. All Sri Vaishnavas must try to fast on Ekadashi. Fasting can be of a different range across people. Like people who can do it can do Nirjalopavasam or fasting without even consuming a drop of water. The next would be trying to sustain with liquids. If that doesn't happen, we can go to fruits. If not, try to have some kind of solid food once a day. Even if that doesn't happen, then we can have some kind of palaharam even twice, that's okay, but never consume cooked whole rice on Ekadashi. That's how the stepwise fasting for Ekadashi goes. Other days when we are not supposed to eat are not complete fasting days. They would be days like when we have to perform some rites for the Pitras, like the days of Shraddha, Amavasya or Masaparipu or any such day. If you are not supposed to consume food Till the ritual is done, we should be able to sustain. Now, this is where, why Adin was talking about having the practice of not eating anything before bathing. So, your system is tuned to remaining hungry for some time, which is good, which is good for the system internally also, and which also has, helps us follow such Shastric practices later in life. So, generally also, if we have a meal, say, post-sunset, say about, 7, 7.30 at night. And the next morning, if we can have a meal only after a bath, then probably we cannot have it before say 7 or 7.30. So that becomes a complete 12-hour window of fasting. Now, if it is a male who is performing Tiruvaradhanam, probably the Tiruvaradhanam ritual will take a little longer. It may become 8.30, 9.30. So it becomes a 14-hour IF window. And then we may have days when the fast goes on up to if it's a Amavasya or something, maybe even 12. So again, the IF window increases. This cleanses the system so well that whatever we consume after that is absorbed to the best of its capacity. So the benefit of IF becomes a routine if we try to follow the lifestyle which is prescribed by Shastras. And IF has all these benefits that they talk about. It, ha it helps in gut healing, cellular waste removal, inflammation reduction, immunity building, detox, etc. And it also gives mental fitness. Now, mental fitness comes by Ahara Shuddhi is what is quoted in the Chandogya Upanishad. Adian will not recite it. It can be seen in the slide here. 
So Ekadeshi fasting and its benefit is well known through the story of Ambarisha for the want of time. Adian is not going to the detail, details of this story. Uh, Adian would want to talk about Dvadashi Parani here. Like we all know that Ambarisha tried to break the Ekadeshi fast by consuming water or doing Jala Parana. That's one way of doing Parana. The ideal way of doing Parana is on a Dvadashi day, when we break the fast, we break the fast by consuming these three things that can be seen on the slide here. Nellikai, Agati Kirai and Sundekai, which are all roasted in ghee without salt and added to rice and had as the first thing to consume before having anything. After Ekadashi fasting, the next day, the first thing to consume should be this. We should not have the regular whatever drink, milk or whatever we may be having in the morning. That should not be consumed, ideally. The parana is to be done directly. Now, doing this parana in this manner will ensure that whatever has happened to your system, your system has rested over the past day. In case we have not consumed anything, it has rested very well. Even if we have consumed something, it has rested to some extent. Now, it has to get back into action. Now, getting back into action with a feast isn't easy. Dvadashi, food is something like a feast. Many things, many sumptuous things are cooked that day. But this feast needs to be digested in the right way. So all these digestive materials are consumed before the beginning of the meal. That's one thing. Also, we avoid the use of tamarind on Dvadashi. That is also because the system would have become acidic to some extent because of less consumption or non-consumption of food. So, to avoid adding on to acids, tamarind is completely avoided. So if we look at any kind of practices that we have been following, there is definitely a scientific backing to it or probably science has decoded what the Shastras say today. Adian would like to put it across like that. The Shastras are more, more ancient than scientific discoveries. So what has been said in the Shastras is being rediscovered and proved by science, which is a good thing and which is something that we should be telling our children because they don't read Shastras in school, they read science. So for them to understand, for them to comprehend, it's important to it's important for us to address their kind of thinking and try to explain to them scientifically. In our times, probably if we question, they would say, Kelvi ke kaade, sonat kele. We can't say that to our children. So if they're asking questions, we are and we should answer them. They should get their answers. That's when they like to follow and the practice will go on. Now, moving on to the third topic, sharing of food. Now, sattvic sharing is very important. This is a question that uh, Adi and I have come across many times. Like kids take dabba to school and then there's a sharing uh, thing that is that has to be addressed, whether to share or not to share. It's a very difficult thing for kids because they are taught sharing is caring in school. So what do they do? Now, it's very important for them to understand that what they are eating is something very special. It is Bhagavad Prasadam. It's got from home. And they can consume something else which is similar and not anything otherwise. Now, this holds true for the practice of eating out also. If we can inculcate the thought of consuming only Bhagavad Prasadam as right into our kids, and it's very easy for them to keep away from eating outside. And not eating outside is a big boon by itself in many ways. In many ways, in practical ways, in spiritual ways, we all know how it is. So the child has to first develop a sense of pride or self-satisfaction in saying that I am eating sattvic food, which is prasad from home. If Asked, the child should definitely share with his friends or her friends. But there's a way to share. Uh, there's this problem that Adian's daughter came and said sometime back. Like Sometimes people would want to take from her box and eat. She, she told me, I didn't know how to handle it. But then, I don't know, probably God gave me that thought that I told them that I will put it into your box and maybe you can eat it like that. So that way, we can avoid HL because we, we can't stop other kids from, uh, what to say, saliva, touching or whatever. 
So in fact, uh, it seems once she did this, my daughter's friend asked her, are you saliva conscious? In the world, terminology is like, so it's fine for them to say that I am saliva conscious, that if that's a fancy term, which is understood by their friends, well and good, they can say that. Now, it's very simple for us to explain to our kids if we can tell them that, suppose there is some non-vegetarian food that comes in his or her friend's lunchbox. Is our child going to allow sharing of that? No, it will be a strict no. I think the child himself or herself will say, no, I don't eat non-veg. Similarly, he can say, I don't eat Bhagavad, non-Bhagavad Prasadam or non-Sattvic food. So that has to come from within and it will take time. It's a process, but we need to keep nurturing the thought in kids. And we also need to understand that they are under a lot of peer pressure and it may not be easy every time, but the thought being in them will take them there at some point of time. So <clears throat> that's basically about all these four points that Irene spoke about. Then we have the last point, which is some examples of the followers of dharmic diet. So always accept from known sources of food is, uh, is an aspect that we spoke about. This happened even during Swami Ramanuja's times when he was threatened with poison even through the water that he was taking. So Kidambi Achan or Madapalli Achan took over the responsibility of cooking for Swami Ramanuja completely. So accepting food from known sources is seen in our Guru Parampara stories. Similarly, serving with affection is a very beautiful thing that we can learn from our Purvacharyas. We all know the famous story of Nadadura Mal, who very fondly gave milk to Varadaraja Pirmal. It is said that one night when Varadaraja Pirmal uh, Pirmal Shainam was over, he appeared in the dream of Nadadura Mal and said that, see, my throat is all burnt today because the milk that I was offered was very hot. So Ammal immediately took action and the next day when milk was being offered to the Lord, it seems he went and he actually asked the Archaka to give milk from an Udrini onto his hand. He checked the temperature of that milk and only which was acceptable to the inner side of his palm, he agreed to be given to the Lord as for Amse. So that kind of care and affection is important whenever we serve anybody. Similarly, only Bhagavad Prasadam is to be accepted. This can be seen from the story of Swami Deshikan and Hayagriya Bhagavan who appeared as a horse. One day when Swami Deshikan did not find any arms, like he used to have unjavritti and whatever he got was what he consumed. One day he did not get enough unjavritti. So he went to sleep like that, saying that I don't have material to cook and offer to the Lord. So I might as well sleep as such. Now the Lord was, Lord, Lord is so kind that he didn't want to, he didn't want his devotee to sleep without anything. So he appeared in the form of a horse and started eating grain from the house of the place where, from the house of the person, uh, where Swami Deshikan was residing that night. Then Swami understood that, okay, it's the Lord's wish that he eat something. So he asked for milk from that house owner, offered it to his high griva murti and then consumed the same. Then finally, we have the story of Periyandavan and Ekadashi fasting. This is a very important and very recent story. Periyandavan was one who would do Nirjala Upavasam on Ekadashi. He would not even consume a drop of water. When he was in his 80s, he became very tired one day on an Ekadashi day. And his shishyas were very worried for his health. He said that, Swami, it's important that you sustain. So please have some buttermilk so that you can pull on till next morning. So Swami very reluctantly agreed to this. But in his mind, he prayed to Lakshmi Devi and he said that, see, you're called as Dharma Nilaya, O Mother. Now, if me who's trying to follow some dharma is not able to follow it for some sake, then how will we ever be true to you people who are embodiments of dharma? This is what he told Pirati in his mind. So it is said that when they were making buttermilk by churning curd, that sound of that churning, that jingling, made him fresh as if he had consumed something. And he said that this sound reminded me of churning the milky ocean 
from where goddess lakshmi emerged and now i'm feeling fresh enough i can sustain till tomorrow and as ekadashi fast got completed successfully so like this if we have the intent to do something right then permal and pirati come and ensure that it becomes fulfilled so those were the stories that we saw so sum summarizing it all in the shri bhashya we have this beautiful verse which says mata pitra sahasre bhyopi vatsala taram shastram shastram is more kind than thousands of parents put together parents are the kindest thousands of parents put together is shastram or even more is shastram so if it is saying something it may be so that we are not understanding the purpose behind it but it definitely means good to us so sometimes it may be good to even follow it without questioning because definitely it is going to keep us happy and keep us successful so that's what i would have to present today i think the time is also up so thank you for this beautiful opportunity kavitarkika samhaya kalyana guna shalini shrimate venkateshaya vedanta gurave namaha நமஸ்காரம் அடியேன் விஜய் நாங்க வந்து யூகேல இருக்கோம் சோ இப்போ இப்ப நீங்க சொன்ன அந்த சாத்விக் டயட் அது எல்லாமே ரொம்ப அருமையா இருந்தது எக்ஸாம்பிள்ஸோட எல்லாமே சூப்பரா சொன்னேன்வாளுக்கு எப்படி இதை வந்து ஃபாலோ பண்றது அதுக்கு ஏதாவது ஒரு ஏன்னா நம்ம எப்பவுமே இங்க வந்து ரொம்ப குளிர் பிரதேசம் இல்லையா நம்ம வந்து ஆஹ் ரொம்ப ஃப்ரீக்வெண்டா இங்க வந்து டெய்லி நம்ம குளிக்கவும் முடியாது வின்டர் டைம்ல எஸ்பெஷலி அதே மாதிரி ஃபுட்டும் வந்து நம்மளுக்கு நம்ம நினைக்கிற மாதிரி கிடைக்காது ஸோ அந்த மாதிரி டைத்துல நம்ம எப்படி மேக்சிமம் எப்படி ஃபாலோ பண்றது தேங்க்யூ அரியன் நீங்க கேட்ட கொஸ்டின்ல இதுக்கு ஆன்சர் இருக்கு மேக்சிமம் எவ்வளவு முடியுமோ அவ்வளவுதான் பண்ண முடியும் அந்தந்த தேசத்துல இருக்கிற ஆச்சாரம் தேசாச்சாரம் அப்படின்னு சொல்றது உண்டு ஸோ இப்போ ஃபார் எக்ஸாம்பிள் பார்த்தோம்னா அந்த நார்த்ல இருக்கிற பூஜாரி எல்லாம் வந்து ஸ்வெட்டர் போட்டுட்டு தான் இருப்பா இப்ப நம்ம ஊர் மாதிரி வெறுமை இருக்கிறதோ இல்ல உத்திரியத்தை போத்திக்கிறது எல்லாம் பண்றது இல்லை அங்கே குளுறதுன்னா அங்கே ஸ்வெட்டர் போட்டுட்டு தான் ஆகணும் அந்த மாதிரி நீங்கள் இருக்கிற இடத்துல எப்படி குளிக்க முடியுமோ அந்த மாதிரி தான் குளிக்க முடியும் பட் குளிக்கிறதுக்கு நிறைய ஆல்டர்னேட்டிவ்ஸ் இருக்கு அது இப்போ மந்திர ஸ்நானம் பண்ணலாம் மானச ஸ்நானம் பண்ணலாம் ஸோ அந்த மாதிரி அதாவது ஆஸ் அ ரிச்சுவல் அதை வந்து பண்ணிட்டு அதுக்கப்புறமா சாப்பிட்றது அப்படிங்கிறத வச்சுக்கலாம் மந்திர ஸ்நானத்துக்கு இப்போ அதுக்குன்னு ஸ்பெசிஃபிக் மந்திரங்கள்லாம் இருக்கு ஆச்சாரியன் உபதேசம் வாங்கிக்கலாம் இல்லை ரொம்ப சிம்பிளி சொல்லணும்னாக்கா பெருமாள் திருமொழியினுடைய ஒரு பாசுரம் இருக்கு தோடுலா மலர் முங்கை தோழினை தோய்ந்ததும் சுடர்வாளியால் அப்படின்னு அந்த பாசுரத்தை சொல்லிட்டு புண்டரி காட்சாயனமா அப்படின்னு சொல்லி ஜலத்தை புரோக்ஷி சென்று பெருமாளை நினைச்சுட்டோம்னா அதுவே ஒரு பியூரிபிகேஷன் அதுவே ஒரு கைண்ட் ஆஃப் மந்திர ஸ்நானம் ஆயிடுறது ஸோ அந்த மாதிரி பண்ணிட்டு சாப்பிடுவோம் அது ஒண்ணு அதே மாதிரி என்ன ஆகாரம் கிடைக்கிறதோ அதை தான் அங்கே சாப்பிட முடியும் அதனால அதுல எதுலாம் ரொம்ப இது தள்ளுபடியா இருக்கிறது இப்போ ஆனியன் கார்லிக் கிராடிஷ் அதெல்லாம் வந்து டெஃபினெட்லி அவாய்ட் பண்ணலாம் வேற இதெல்லாம் இந்த த்ரெஷ்ஹோல்டில் இருக்கிற வெஜிடபிள்ஸ் தான் கிடைக்கிறது வேற ஆப்ஷன்ஸே இல்லைன்னா அப்போ அது ஓகே அப்படின்னு யூ கேன் கோ ஃபர் இட் சம்திங் விச் இஸ் வர்ஜிதம் அப்படின்னு தெரிஞ்சதை அவாய்ட் பண்ண ட்ரை பண்ணோம்னா நல்லா இருக்கும் சரி ஓகே தேங்க்ஸ் ஸ்ரீ வேதாந்த தேசிகன் ஹேண்ட் ரைஸ் பண்ணிருக்கேளே கேட்கலாம் வாமிக்கு <laughs> 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 it is not sattvic definitely you can try slowly to get out of the habit anything which is addictive is not sattvic so 
இட்ஸ் அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்டபிள் தட் சம்படி ஹஸ் பீன் ட்ரிங்கிங் காஃபி ஃபார் லாங் அது எப்படி விடுறது ஐயோ காஃபி அடிக்குமா அதெல்லாம் புரியறது மெது மெதுவாக தான் பண்ணணும் நம்ம எல்லாமே அது சரியில்லைன்னு தெரிஞ்சுட்டா போகிறோம் அப்புறம் என்னைக்கா ஒரு நாள் அதுலேருந்து நம்ம வெளியில் வரலாம் மெதுவாக any other questions i think i'm correct yeah um ah uh, romba alaga it was such a beautiful uh, talk and uh, very practically presented it is a it is not an easy topic to speak about in the in ipo irukra kaalathile edhu sonnalum adha adha thappa eduthukaradhukku nariya opportunities eduthukra and people find ways to mistake it in the wrong way in and the madri or and also the topic is such that uh, but adhilayum you have placed everything on on a uh, on out in the front and it is up to us to make the right choices for ourselves and our families and our for for our children thank you so much i don't think anybody else could have given uh, a talk on this topic better than what we heard from you today i hope this was beneficial for everybody who has joined uh, this is the last uh, talk in our uh, talk series we have that has been running these four months the same around the same time in the next month adutha maasam end of december we are having our final carnival event mindful margari 2024 in the varsham the topic that we have chosen is alvargal through the two days we are going to go deep into alvargal charitram in different ways the story workshops as uh, through games through songs and uh, through activities and craft and art it entirely themed around children just like last time all ellaro avashyam kalandukano please do spread the word ungalku ungaloda satsangathukku avashyama therivikano nu prarthisikire prabhasineshaka romba sandosham thalaiyallal kai maarilo thank you so much for uh gracing us on this occasion we mm-hmm. look forward to hearing more and more from you yeah. in the future and looking and forward to mindful margari it is really wonderful last year very very novel entertaining romba nanna irundhathu so aalvargal vera topic solirken really interesting romba sandosham all the very best i am looking forward to see nanya jay jay shri sir shrimati ramanuja rama ellarku goda govinda shubharatri Thank you. Goda Govinda. Goda Govinda. Goda Govinda. Goda Govinda.